Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. My name is Kelsey Ergo. Um, I'm a PhD student at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and the paper is co-authored by my advisors, Dr. Jaime Arguello and Dr. Rob Capra. And sort of in the uh, theme of this morning's keynote, um, this is purely a conceptual paper and no results will be presented today. Okay, so there are two uh, main sources of motivation for this paper. Um, the first comes from the field of interactive information retrieval, or IIR. Um, search tasks are very important in IIR, and they are used to observe and evaluate systems and tools, and they are also researched as an object of study themselves, investigating how task characteristics influence user needs, behaviors, and pre- and post-task perceptions. So prior work on the characteristics characterization of tasks involve uh, subjective and objective dimensions. Um, some of the subjective dimensions have included aspects such as perceived difficulty, and objective dimensions have included aspects such as complexity. Um, one particularly influential lens of task complexity has been uh, research surrounding cognitive complexity. So cognitive complexity is defined as the types and variety of mental tasks that are needed to complete a learning intensive search task. And um, prior work has applied the Anderson and Crathwell taxonomy to develop search tasks according to their cognitive complexity. So the second source of motivation for this paper is from the search as learning community. So in this community, there are two central questions. One is what factors contribute to learning during search? And two, what behavioral measures are indicative of learning? So both of these questions require some reliable metric of learning assessment. In prior work, there have been two major methods of assessing learning. Um, the first is through multiple choice questions or some set of questions with predetermined correct answers. Um, and the second method of assessment is through scoring of written summaries. So some prior work has applied the Anderson and Crathwell taxonomy as a rubric to score those written summaries. And so now I'd like to take a step back and talk about the Anderson and Crathwell taxonomy in a bit more detail and then speak about how we would apply the taxonomy in a way that's different from prior work in IIR and search as learning. So the Anderson and Crathwell taxonomy was um, developed in education research and was adapted from Bloom's One Dimensional Taxonomy published in 1956. Um, the taxonomy was adapted by Anderson and Crathwell in 2001 and Anderson and Crathwell um, modified the taxonomy in various ways, among them changing the cognitive levels from nouns to verbs and adding a second dimension called the knowledge dimension. So central to a teacher's work is the notion of a objective. So it's some implicit or explicit goal of what the teacher wants a student to learn as a result of the teacher's instruction. And Anderson and Crathwell developed the two-dimensional taxonomy in order to more precisely define and articulate these learning objectives. Um, the Anderson and Crathwell two-dimensional taxonomy is also useful for defining and articulating learning activities and learning assessment and also um, making sure that those three are in alignment, increasing the probability that students actually learn the knowledge on which they'll be tested. So let's take a look at the dimensions of the taxonomy a bit more closely. Um, the first dimension we'll discuss is the cognitive process dimension. This dimension describes how learners think and is made up of six different cognitive processes. The first is remember, where a learner retrieves relevant knowledge from long-term memory, and this includes things like recalling or regurgitating information. Um, next is understand, where learners construct meaning from instructional messages, including oral, written, and graphic communication. So that includes exemplifying or summarizing information. Um, apply is when a learner carries out or uses the information in a given situation. Analyze involves learners breaking material into constituent parts and determining how the parts relate to one another um, and to an overall structure or purpose. So this involves learners distinguishing and differentiating information. Um, next is evaluate, um, where learners make judgments based on criteria and standards. 
And this cognitive process um, can involve learners critiquing or judging information, given some well-reasoned logical arguments to support that judgment. And then finally, we have create, where learners put elements together to form a coherent or functional whole, um, or reorganize elements into a new pattern or structure. And this involves learners using information to create some novel uh, representation or form of the information. So the second dimension uh, we will discuss is the knowledge type dimension. And this dimension describes what learners uh, know and is made up of four different knowledge types. So um, the first knowledge type is uh, factual knowledge, and that involves basic elements that a learner uh, must know to be acquainted with a discipline or solve problems within it. So an example of factual knowledge would be the date of the historical event. Um, the second knowledge type is conceptual knowledge, which involves the interrelationships among the basic elements within a larger structure. Um, that enable them to function together. So examples of conceptual knowledge include things like theories and principles. Um, next is procedural knowledge, which involves how to do something, um, methods or inquiry, and criteria for using skills and techniques. So examples of procedural knowledge are things like algorithms or methods. And finally um, is the metacognitive knowledge type, which involves knowledge of cognition in general, as well as awareness and knowledge of one's own cognition. So examples of metacognitive knowledge include self-knowledge or a learner understanding how much he or she knows at any given time. Okay, so this is the taxonomy. Um, and it's comprised of these two orthogonal dimensions the cognitive process dimensions going along the top and the knowledge dimension going along the side there. Um, and each of these dimensions run along distinct continuums. So the cognitive process dimension runs along a continuum of complexity um, from the lowest level of cognitive complexity of remember up through the highest level of complexity it create. And then the knowledge dimension runs along a continuum from concrete to abstract with uh, factual knowledge being the most concrete and metacognitive knowledge being the most abstract. So we also argue that this dimension uh, runs along, uh, also runs along a continuum um, from isolated to interrelated. So um, facts are the most, are more isolated than concepts. Um, facts are standalone units of information, whereas concepts often require a learner to understand related concepts in order to understand the concept of interest. Um, and the knowledge dimension also exists on a continuum from objective to subjective. Um, facts, of course, uh, hopefully, are the most objective, um, but as we move up through the knowledge dimension, units of knowledge can become more subjective. Um, for example, a procedure often has a fixed product or outcome, but the steps and order of steps can be uh, subjective to the executor. Um, and metacognitive knowledge is largely comprised of the subjective perspective of the individual's understanding of his or her own learning. Okay. So, uh, prior work in search task development um, has applied only the cognitive dimension of Anderson and Crackwell taxonomy, and we argue that IIR research should consider both cognitive and knowledge dimensions, and this is for two main reasons. So, first, um, considering both dimensions will help to avoid confounds. Um, after mapping previously developed tasks to the two-dimensional taxonomy, we noticed that the tasks are largely grouped along the diagonal. Um, and prior work using these tasks showed that um, the tasks involving complex cognitive processes uh, require more effort. However, without controlling for the knowledge dimension, um, there are some open questions that remain. So is this effect equally strong across all knowledge types? Or does the effect grow stronger as we go down the knowledge dimension from factual to metacognitive? So second, we argue that there's uh, important research in studying the knowledge dimension itself. So what is the impact of the knowledge dimension on user needs and behaviors? Um, we hypothesize that the level of difficulty may increase as you move down the knowledge dimension. 
And also certain information sources may correlate with knowledge types. So, um, for example, searchers lo looking for conceptual knowledge may visit Wikipedia most often. And those looking for procedural knowledge may use YouTube more than other information sources. So this leaves us with a question, how can we use Anderson and Crathwell's two-dimensional taxonomy to create search learning scenarios or SLSs? So first, what is an SLS? Um, so we introduced this term of search learning scenario to distinguish from a simple search task. Um, it's a search task with a specific learning objective. Uh, the SLS involves searching, but also engaging with information for the purpose of learning. SLS also takes into consideration the alignment of objective and assessment. Um, how can we create an SLS using the taxonomy? Um, so Anderson and Crathwell frame learning objectives as a verb-noun pair. And if we consider our search learning scenario to be a learning objective, then we can also envision our SLS as a verb-noun pair. Um, the verb maps to the cognitive level in the taxonomy, and the noun maps to the knowledge type. So let's take a look at an example. Um, the student will distinguish among confederal, federal, and unitary systems of government. So this learning objective is categorized at the intersection of analyzed cognitive process and conceptual knowledge because the word distinguish uh, points to differentiating and discriminating, and the word systems indicates uh, generalized structures or frameworks. So given this framework, we have created a completed table of sample search learning scenarios. And if we look across the procedural knowledge row, we can get a better idea of what these look like. So starting with remember procedural, um, recall the steps of a merge sort algorithm. This is remember because we are asking the learner to remember information and procedural knowledge type because the knowledge is now. And then we have understand procedural. Um, we ask the searcher to explain merge sort to someone completely new to sorting algorithms. This is the same procedural knowledge type, but it is understand because it asks the searcher to explain the algorithm, uh, prompting them to restate the knowledge in their own words. Next, we have apply procedural, run a merge sort on this set of integers. This is again procedural knowledge type, but it is applied because it asks the searcher to actually use the algorithm. Um, analyze procedural, distinguish merge, short, merge sort from heap sort. Um, this asks the searchers to be able to distinguish between two different sorting algorithms um, and analyze cognitive process. Just two more here. Um, evaluate procedural, judge whether merge sort or heap sort is most efficient and explain why. Um, this asks the searcher to make a judgment on which algorithm is most efficient and support that judgment with an evidence-based logical argument. Um, this judgment is an example of the evaluate cognitive process. And finally, we have create procedural. Um, propose a novel sorting algorithm that is inspired by but not the same as merge sort. So this asks the searcher to develop a new algorithm using the knowledge they have of other sorting algorithms. And this novel development is an example of the create cognitive process. So next we'll look at how we can use the Anderson and Crathwell taxonomy to assess learning. So similar to um, the taxonomy applied to search learning scenario creation, the Anderson and Crathwell taxonomy can also be used to develop learning assessment. Um, the learning assessment can take two different forms. Uh, the first is assessment as targeted questions, and this type of assessment is focused and measures the depth of learning with respect to a single cell. And the assessment can also be used as a coding scheme to score written summaries or short answers. And this type of assessment is distributed and measures uh, the breadth of learning across cells by tracking how many cells a searcher exhibited. So both types of learning assessment can be developed similar to the search learning scenarios where we map the verb of the assessment um, to the cognitive level and the noun of the assessment to the knowledge type. Um, here we take the previous example and adjust it just slightly to make a targeted assessment question. Um, distinguish among confederal, federal, and unitary
unitary systems of government. So here again, the verb distinguish points to analyze cognitive process and systems are conceptual knowledge. Um, this example is similar to the previous example to help illustrate that the search learning scenario can be trivially modified in order to become a targeted assessment for the same learning objective. So this is a completed taxonomy of uh, distributed assessment criteria. Um, the taxonomy is different from the sample search learning scenarios we looked at previously because it is uh, a generalized template of distributed assessment criteria. So we'll take a look at a few examples here. Um, remember factual uh, checks that a searcher has recalled a fact. So if a researcher were to score a summary, if any fact were recalled, then the searcher successfully exhibited a remember factual learning objective. Um, apply conceptual checks that a searcher used the definition of a concept to find a solution. And finally, create procedural checks that a searcher proposed a novel procedure that serves the same function. Again, this can involve any procedural knowledge and is generalized in order to be used as distributed assessment to check how many cells were acquired by the searcher. So in summary of this section, um, the Anderson and Crathwall two-dimensional taxonomy can be used for both search learning scenario and learning assessment development. And utilizing both dimensions of the taxonomy when creating search learning scenarios will help to avoid confounds in future research by systematically controlling for the knowledge type. And using the two-dimensional taxonomy will also allow us to explore and understand the knowledge dimension. Um, the Anderson and Crathwell taxonomy can also be used for developing assessment questions and criteria. Um, this assessment can be focused as in targeted questions uh, given a particular learning objective and distributed as a scoring mechanism for summaries. The focused assessment can be useful in understanding the depth of learning a searcher has acquired given a single cell and the distributed assessment is useful for identifying the number of cells a searcher has acquired. So given these applications of the Anderson and Crathwell two-dimensional taxonomy, uh, we propose several future research directions. So uh, first, we're interested in understanding the knowledge dimension. What impacts does the knowledge dimension have on user needs and behaviors? Um, as we hypothesized previously, there may be a perceived difficulty increase as we move down the knowledge dimension. Um, also of interest are certain knowledge types correlated with specific information sources. So um, again, perhaps visiting uh, YouTube or viewing videos with procedural knowledge learning objectives may lead to bigger knowledge gains or conceptual knowledge learning objectives might involve read, reading Wikipedia articles. So secondly, we're interested in understanding how searchers traverse the two-dimensional taxonomy, um, meaning how do searchers break apart a learning objective into sub-goals in order to arrive at the final objective. So for example, um, given this learning objective, judge whether merge sort or heap sort is most efficient and explain why. Um, a searcher who is new to the notion of sorting algorithms might start by issuing a query on heap sort. And after reading for a while, um, she may issue a, a query on merge sorts. And then after reading an article explaining merge sort, comes across the notion of divide and conquer algorithms. So she's not familiar with divide and conquer concepts, so in order to better understand that, she issues a divide and conquer query, and after reading, decides that actually running a, running a sorting algorithm um, would be useful in better understanding heap sort and merge sort. And after successfully running merge sort algorithm, she realizes that her objective is to look at which is most efficient, so she issues a query that distinguishes uh, merge sort from heap sort, and comes across an article with a graph that shows the efficiency of merged sort being greater than that of heap sort, and so finally arrives at her judgment choosing merged sort as the more efficient algorithm using uh, the article and graph as supporting evidence. So we are actually planning a study to examine common pathways along the taxonomy based on a specific learning objective uh, belonging to a specific cell in the taxonomy. 
Um, so far in our pilot testing, we've been observing that participants have a tendency to start tasks with sub-goals associated with uh, understand conceptual, which is interesting. <laughs> Thirdly, uh, looking at future research directions, uh, the taxonomy is useful for informing system evaluation. Using a focused or distributed learning assessment metric will allow us to better understand what and how much a searcher has learned when comparing systems and impact of tools. And finally, the taxonomy is useful for informing system design, so we could potentially develop a tool uh, providing scaffolding or presentation of sub-goals for searchers given a common pathway for a particular learning objective. Um, also, certain user characteristics may influence the pathway a searcher traverses. So, for example, domain knowledge may dictate where a searcher starts in the taxonomy. Um, a novice may start at a, um, and evaluate conceptual learning objective in the understand conceptual cell, where an expert may start to analyze conceptual. And understanding these differences could allow us to infer a searcher's uh, domain knowledge. Um, we can also view Anderson and Crackwell's taxonomy as a Markov chain with transition probabilities between cells. This would allow us to know where a searcher is likely to go next and uh, present information sources that are relevant to the next sub-goal. And finally, if we find that sub-goals do influence search behaviors, um, using hidden Markov models may be a way of predicting a user's end goal or learning objective or even predict a user's current sub-goal. Okay, thank you all for listening and thank you to Sigair for the generous travel grant uh, to be able to attend the meeting.